we'll go ahead and get everyone to stand if you will. And, uh, let's join in together here in a few moments with a uh, song. Uh, you find a red book there under the bench or the seat, either underneath you, uh, beside you, or in front of you, somewhere. You should be able to find a red book. The church Hill. Let's start this morning by singing page 279. It's 279. This song here, I, I uh, can remember it, even as a small child singing this song quite often. And uh, I, uh, I would like to thank this morning that, uh, that everyone here in this room knows Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you don't, uh, what a wonderful day it would be for you to come to know Him. And make certain, without any question, no doubts in your mind, that if you would die before sunset today, that you know you'd go to heaven. That's what this song is talking about. I, I want to say this. I know, I know that I know that my name is there. I have no doubt in my mind uh, that if uh, I go, go, go home tonight, I know exactly where I'm going to. And uh, Margaret sent me a text, I think it was uh, Friday evening, I stand to be great things Friday evening, and she said, we're home. Maybe that's what I said, we're home or I'm home, or I said, finally home, thank you, thank you, finally home. I sent her a text back, I said, that's what Fanny Crosby said, finally home. And uh, you know, Tombstone, it said uh, that she did what she could. And uh, I hope and pray today these, uh, these kind of a good mementos of things of people that know Jesus Christ, our Savior. And I hope and pray that as we stand here today, that every person in this room can say, I know that I know that I know that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. And if you don't, I want to encourage you to come to know Him. I want to say one more thing uh, uh, to add to this. 1871. Dale Moody was holding a service and uh, 
he spent some time in that service talking about uh, what are you do with Jesus. And referring to the scriptures where uh, Pilate asked the question, what, what do you want us to do with Jesus? And uh, he presented that in the message that night at the church that he was uh, speaking at, uh, where he was pastoring at, as a matter of fact, at the time, if I'm not mistaken. Had a large crowd there that night, a very large crowd, and he presented the gospel with the understanding of what will you do with Jesus? What will you do with Jesus? And as he come to the conclusion of the service, he said, I'm going to give you one week to think that through. I'm going to give you one week to think through what will you do with Jesus? And when you come back here next Sunday, he said, I want you to make a decision. Uh, what, what will you do with Jesus? I, he said, I want you to have that on your mind all week long. And when you come back next week, I want you to make the decision within your heart what will you do with Jesus? I want you to be prepared to make that decision when you come back. Next Sunday, there was no service. He said, yeah, I'll never make that mistake again. He said, I gave him a week to make that decision. I will never make that mistake again. The Chicago fires come through, just about destroyed the Chicago end to end. Those people never assemble together again in that manner. I say that this morning because you don't wait till next week. You don't know what this week's going to hold. You don't know what's going to happen to you tonight, tomorrow, next week, next month. You have no idea what's going to happen. And you need to make some decisions, serious decisions right now. While you have the time, the opportunity, the right mind, and you can still think. You need to make that decision. What will you do with Jesus? I know my name is there. Let's join in together. Turn your Bible to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. The total message this morning is challenge accepted. Challenge accepted. Matthew chapter 7, verse 1 through 5. You know, that statement, challenge accepted, is a bold statement. Challenge accepted. When somebody says that, you know something's about to happen. A challenge has been issued and someone says, raises their hand and says, challenge accepted. You ever hear the old saying, my hat's in the ring? You ever hear that saying before? You know what that means? I think that had to do with, with boxing, with fighting, maybe like at an amateur level. And you've got somebody in the ring who's, you know, the baddest of the bad. And somebody takes their hat off and they throw it in the ring and say, I'm coming to get my hat. And we're going to see if you're the baddest in the ring. 
Throwing the hat in the ring says, challenge accepted. You think you're the baddest man in the room? Let's find out. There's something, there's, that's an action statement. Challenge accepted. You know something is about to happen when someone says this. But saying the words challenge accepted is easy. You know, there's a boldness to that. You want to be the person that stands up when everybody else is afraid, everybody else is cowering. You want to be the one that stands up and says, challenge accepted. You issue that challenge. There's a, there's a Christian apologist I love where he goes and finds the, the, I mean, the sharpest of the sharp skeptics and atheists, and they'll go on their YouTube channels or, the, or, or their different accounts, and they'll issue a challenge, and they'll say, oh, they, you know, Christians say this, and this is false, and that's false, and that's false. And this guy says, uh, challenge accepted. And he puts together an elaborate, detailed video with about a hundred different sources saying, you are dead wrong, and he shuts their mouth. I have, I have such admiration for someone who stands up and says, challenge accepted. But that's the easy part. It is an easy statement to make. But when you make it, now comes the hard part. You see, now, now I've got to go into the ring with that 300-pound guy who's all, all muscle. Now comes the hard part. I threw my hat in. I was bold. I said, challenge accepted. But now comes the hard part because that's a big dude in the ring. And this may not end well. It's an easy statement, but it's followed by hard things. Challenge accepted. Look at Matthew chapter 7. If you would please stand in honor of God's word as we read this together. Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. Let's start here. Judge not. Have you ever heard that before? <laughs> that is... By far the most quoted verse in all the Bible. But it's not even the most quoted verse. It's the most, it's the most quoted 30% of a verse. Judge not. Signs everywhere. Judge not. Doesn't the Bible say judge not? It's interpreted. In our society, this is the most quoted verse in our society today. Judge not. They don't know anything. They don't even know the term Bible, but they know judge not. So what's that saying? Well, I'll tell you how it's interpreted by our society. It is being interpreted to say judge not means you cannot call anything wrong. You cannot say anything is wrong because your Bible says judge not. That is the interpretation. My question is, is it the correct interpretation? You might have to read more than two words. The interpretation says you cannot make a moral judgment between good and evil, right and wrong. That is how that statement is interpreted by our society. Which is, of course, absurd. Are you saying it's wrong to say, are you saying it's wrong to judge? You're judging. If that's what they're saying. It, it's, it's so false that if, if it's true, it's false. It is, it is a contradiction. It's an inherent contradiction. When you say judge not, you're judging that judging is wrong, and therefore you are judging. Not only is it not true, is it not the right interpretation? It can't be the right interpretation. It cannot be true. And in verse 15, when you read the context of Matthew chapter 7, in this very same setting where Jesus it continues to talk, he says, Beware of false prophets. I have a question. How do you know they're a false prophet? How can you know without making a moral judgment? The fact is we must make a judgment. It's imperative that we make accurate judgments. Every time the scriptures say be sober-minded, use discernment, it is telling us to make wise judgments, make accurate judgments. So if judge not doesn't mean that you can't call anything wrong or make a moral judgment between good and evil, right and wrong, if, it does, if that's not what it means, then what does it mean? Here's what it means in context. Do not judge hypocritically. That's, a, that's exactly what Jesus is saying. Do not judge hypocritically. Judge yourself by the same standard by which you judge others. I would put it this way. Do not judge someone a false prophet and then turn around and be a false prophet yourself. That's the kind of judgment Jesus is condemning. He's saying you judge, you judge prophets to be either true prophets or false prophets, but you judge yourself by the same standard. Is what you're saying a true prophecy, a true teaching, or a false prophecy and a false teaching? 
Do not judge hypocritically. It's not so much, I heard a pastor say this this week, it's not so much, it's not the decision you make, the judgment you make, it's what you do right after that judgment that decides this. Are you judging hypocritically? It, it isn't so much in, in the decision you've made, but it's, it's saying, what are you going to do in light of the judgment you just made? Do not judge hypocritically. Now, with that out of the way, let's continue to read the passage, and you're going to see the context that that's exactly what Jesus is saying, especially explicitly in verse 2. Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, you shall be judged. And with what measure you meet, or measure, it shall be measured to you again. He's saying you're going to be judged by the same standard that you judge other people because God is not going to be hypocritical. And we should not be either. Verse 3. And why beholdest thou the moat that is in thy brother's eye? A moat is like a speck. So why beholdest the speck or the moat that is in your brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the moat or the speck out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in your own eye? Thou hypocrite! You see, this is about hypocrisy. Not making judgments, it's about hypocritical judgments. Thou hypocrite! First, cast out the beam out of thine own eye. And then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote of the speck out of thy brother's eye. You don't leave the speck, but you have to deal with the beam first in your own eye. That's what Christ is saying. We have, I'll say this, we have something to say to the world. We have a message for the world. But we have to deal with it in our own hearts before we communicate it to the world. That's what this is talking about. Let's go, Lord, in prayer together. Father, we thank you for your word, the power of your word, the clarity of your word. God, if, it, if your word ever seems unclear, the, the lack of clarity, the confusion, the distortion, the ambiguity is in us, not in your word. We see that here. We, it, it's not the, the scriptures are not a problem. It's when we twist the scriptures. As, as Paul describes, that they, that, or as Peter describes, that, that your word gets twisted. That, God, we see that your word is clear. And we want to clearly accept and deal with your word this morning. I pray that for every person in this room, no exception. Every person that might be listening to this recording, no exception. I especially pray for this for fathers listening to this message this morning. That God, we would deal with exactly what your word says. We've established, we know what it's not saying, but now we have to deal with what it does say. Help us to be authentic. Help us to be everything, everything possible to be the opposite of hypocritical. Help us to be consistent and authentic and real about who we are and what we need to do in our lives. God, I pray your blessing upon this time together now. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Be seated. Challenge accepted. This next slide is a picture of a guy named Will Barati. I don't know how well you can see that. Will Barati, if I'm pronouncing his last name correctly, holds the world record for bench press at 1,105 pounds. That's a picture of him, I think, actually doing that bench press with an assist shirt. 1,105 pounds. He holds the world record. You go to this next slide. This is a guy named Julius Maddox. He holds the world record for the, the highest bench press raw. Without it, there's an assist shirt that's this really tight shirt that helps protect your, your shoulders as you're bench pressing. And so a lot of guys can add 300 pounds if they have that shirt on. Well, this guy bench presses 782 pounds raw, maybe with just a belt on, no shirt, no assist shirt, all that weight on his shoulders. Now, I think this is good for Father's Day. This is a good manly uh, analogy here. So we have Will Barad, we have Julius Maddox, Bench press 782 pounds raw. I think that's probably the amount of weight that he's leaning on there. Next we have Scott Mendelson. This is what happens when you fail to set a world record, when you're attempting one. He ripped his left pectoral muscle. You can see all the bruising and the blood just, just gushed all over his chest, down his side. This is what it looks like to fail to set the world record for bench press. Now I have one question. Why? <laughs> Why? Why would you do this? Why would you do this? I want to leave that picture up there as I ask that question. 
Why would you do this? Do you think he quit lifting weights after this? Do you know what his next question was? Does it require surgery? If so, when can I get it scheduled? What's my recovery time? I'll promise you, I, I, don't even have to know, I don't even have to hear the interview. I know his mentality is, how quickly can I get back under the bar? That's this guy's mentality, because you don't get there without that mentality. He bench presses over 1,000 pounds as well. Had the world record, I believe, for a period of time. Why would you do this to yourself? Can you imagine the pain? I think you can watch, if you want to watch it, videos, you can watch videos of the pectoral muscle blowing out. I think Julius Maddox experienced the same injury. There's a video and he's attempting it, and you can see his muscle go from here to here, if you would like to watch it. Can you imagine the pain? Can you imagine the amount of intense training it takes to bench press over a thousand pounds? Do you imagine the amount of time it takes? Why would you do this? Well, I have a theory. I think you do this because there's something inside of us, especially as men, but it's, it's every one of us, men and women. There's something inside of us as human beings, but I would say especially as men. And here's the thing. I think it's placed there by God. I think it's placed there by God. I think we're supposed to have it. It was there by design. It's not a, it is not a result of the corruption of the fall and of sin, but it's placed there by design that challenges us to do hard things. And here's the, here's the big qualification. Not in spite of something being hard, but because it's hard, I want to do it. Because it's hard. Not in spite of being hard. We do some things in spite of it being hard. But I'm talking about doing things because it is hard. It requires discipline, sacrifice, focus, self-denial, putting in the work and putting in the time. Are those bad things or good things? Those are good things. Sacrifice is a good thing. Discipline is a good thing. Focus is a good thing. Self-denial is a good thing. Putting in the work, putting in the time. These are not sinful things. These are good things. I think there, this is a desire that I'm, I'm talking about this morning that is in us, and it was placed there by God, by design. But here's the thing. This discipline and sacrifice and focus and self-denial, putting in the work, putting in the time, this is not in there. This is not about bench pressing or 10,000 other things that could distract us or 10,000 other things that this God-given drive could be wasted on. It's bigger than bench press. And it goes deeper than just building up your body to its pinnacle. Here's the question I would ask. What kind of men are Will Barati and Julius Maddox and Scott Mendelson. What kind of men are they? What kind of sons? Let's make a moral judgment. Are they good sons or bad sons? What kind of brothers? If they have siblings, would they say my brother is a good brother? What kind of husbands are they? What kind of fathers are they? Is this guy a good dad? I don't know these, I don't, I don't know these guys. I have, I have no earthly idea what the answer to that question is. I'm just throwing the question out there. Is this guy a good dad? He may be a great dad. He may be a terrible dad. He may be something in between. I would ask this question, is this man, I don't, again, I don't know these guys at all. I pulled their pictures off the internet this morning. Does this guy worship and follow Jesus? I don't know. But you know that there is an answer. It's, and it's subjective. We want to make everything so subjective. It is not subjective at all. Either he follows Christ or he does not. There is an answer. Does this guy worship and follow Jesus? Is he a child of God? Is he powerful in the Holy Spirit? Let me, let me phrase it this way, which I think really connects the two. 
Does Scott Mendelson love the Lord his God with all of his heart, soul, mind, and strength? That's the question. Is this guy strong? Or is he weak? That's the question. And you can look at that picture and say, Jordan, this guy's obviously strong. Is he really? Or is he weak? Are these guys, these pictures that I'm showing, these huge men, probably every one of them is probably over 300 pounds. Are they strong or are they weak? Is this guy enslaved by the bondage of sin? Enslaved? Can you imagine trying to enslave this guy? Trying to, I mean, imagine if this guy committed a crime, you're trying to take him into custody. What a fight that would be. But what if he's enslaved himself? You think about Samson. The strongest man to ever live, but yet he was bound. Enslaved. Is this guy enslaved by lust? Addicted to internet pornography? If he's not, he's in a tiny minority of men who are not. I would stay, say statistically, at least two out of the three of them are addicted to internet pornography. They are slaves to their phone. They can't stop looking at it. Their hands are, yeah, they may be doing this all day long, but then at night when nobody's around, their hands are like this and they're bound looking at their phone. That's weakness. They're enslaved. Maybe they say, well, I like looking at it. You, I don't want to stop. But even if they, but if they did want to stop, they can't stop. It's addiction. When you're bound, when your hands are bound, you are weak. Are they bound by lust? Are they enslaved by impatience? Do these guys have anger issues? I could, pre, I could prejudge them and say, yeah, I'm sure they must. They're probably you know, on steroids and they have rage issues and anger issues. They might be as gentle as, as they might, might be gentle giants. I don't know. But I'm asking the question, are they enslaved by impatience and anger? You see these guys, how huge they are, but does this little muscle in their mouth control them? Can they bridle their tongue? Or does that little tongue dominate them and they can't control it? Chances are, according to James, probably that tongue controls them. They say things and they can't control their tongue. Their tongue controls them. Again, maybe being tied to impatience or anger. Are they slaves to their emotions? To pride. I would say these guys are in serious danger of being enslaved by pride. Why do they do it? What drives them? Is it envy? Is it to say, I have to be the best? I'm envious of the record that guy just set when he took mine away? Is it envy? Is it coveting? Is it coveting a world record? You know how small that is and how weak that is? This takes a lot of time. And they, again, I'm not, I am not indicting any of these guys. They may have it, the balance exactly right. They may at a certain time of day say, I'm leaving the gym. I got to go play with my kids. They might do that. I'm not, I'm not prejudging anything here. I'm just saying it takes a lot of time. But there's a good chance in this kind of competition at this level, their kids get sacrificed to win the competition. That is so weak just so they can have the title, just so they can have the trophy, just so they can beat their competitor. They're sacrificing their kids. That is a weak father. I don't care how much you bench press, you're weak. Weak. I would even say pathetically weak. You're like a kid. You're like a six-year-old. It's all about you. No sacrifice. It's all about yourself. These men that I'm showing you here, they, are they really strong? Or are they really weak? 
You see, that's the hard stuff. What I'm describing is the hard stuff. It's hard to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. It's hard. It's not easy. Christ says, take up your cross and follow me. That's not easy. These guys might be too weak to do it. I may be too weak to do it. You may be too weak to do it. This is the hard stuff that I'm talking about. This is discipline and sacrifice. And Christ is challenging us to do the hard stuff. He won't settle with it. How, you know, it would be easier if he said, bench press a thousand pounds. We start training in the morning. That would be an easy goal to achieve compared to this other one. When he says, deny yourself, that he who would be first, let him be last. And he says, wash feet. That's hard. That's the hard things to do. Jesus Christ is challenging us to do the hard stuff. To follow Christ. When the world, it's like trying to walk up the Mississippi River going upstream. When the world is hitting you like this and Christ is walking ahead of you saying, follow me. That's the hard stuff. To experience His transforming, life-changing power, and I mean true power. Experiencing His transforming, life-changing power. To wage war on sin and evil that has enslaved us. To hunt down and destroy every sin in the deepest parts of our hearts. That is the hard stuff for which God made you, for which God made me. Those are the hard things to which Christ calls us. So in light of all that, I would, if you're here this morning, I hope you feel challenged by what I just said. I hope you feel challenged. And I hope you have the boldness as you're sitting there and you need to count the cost. I hope you have the boldness. You see, when you hear challenge accepted, that's such a, that is such a strong statement. I mean, that's such boldness. But you know, it's sad. When the, the challenge is issued, people start looking down. Looking at their watch. That's weak. You know, it's bold to say, challenge accepted. That's hard. But I'm going after it. And I'm going to probably get my tail kicked. But I'm still going after it. To throw your hat in the ring, because once the hat's in the ring, they're going to pick it up and say, whose hat's this? And I've got to go get it. Say, it's my hat. But the question this morning is, oh, so I'm laying out this challenge. I mean, and it is a challenge. The question is, where do you even start? Where do we start? If we're going to go after this, let's, let's count the cost and say, where do I have to start? Here's where you start. Here's where I start, right here. Right here. Not out there, right here. This eye. I have to start here. There's a beam in my eye. We start with ourselves. The church has failed in a lot of ways because right out of the gate, we go out there. You failed. Because I'm out here picking, picking at your eye with a beam in mind. Christ says, get back in the gate. <laughs> you skip step one. What are you doing in step two? Step one, you've got to deal with this. And you have to extract that beam out of your own eye. You don't jump to step two. And the church, on many, and that's where the hypocrisy has come in. We've jumped to step two and neglected to do step one. And these are real objective things, by the way. We deal with the beam. I deal with the beam in my own eye. And do you notice that Christ, it's assumed that everyone has the beam. He doesn't even mention it. He says, why are you looking at the, at the speck in your brother's eye? Deal with the beam in your own eye. He says that universally to everyone. No one in this room is an exception to that. Why, how do we know that? Because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We've got a huge beam 
in our own eye. Everyone has a beam in their own eye. We have to deal with this first. It is assumed that everyone has it, and we do. You know, I don't know if you've, what kind of injuries you might have sustained in your life, but I can tell you, your first impulse, you think about this beam in your eye and what it's going to take to extract it. Um, I've got a torn, I think I've got a torn labrum, my right shoulder, and I found out recently, a coworker of mine said, I got the same thing and it caused my shoulder to dislocate. And I heard that and said, boy, that's great. I'm glad to hear that. I can imagine my shoulder doing whatever. He said, one time I was just carrying a gallon of milk and I bumped it against the wall and suddenly that gallon of milk was about six inches lower. And he said, I had to raise my shoulder up and, and it popped back into place. And I'm like, I'm saying, that's not good. I, I grew up watching Lethal Weapon. You remember Riggs? Uh, Mel Gibson used to dislocate his shoulder. He'd like do it to get you know to win a bet, and then he'd have to like go over to like a file cabinet and and ram his shoulder back into it to pop it back in place. And I told I told the people I said if you ever see my shoulder dislocated, here's my here's my first thought: don't touch it, don't touch it. Go get a pistol and shoot me in the head. It's going to stay out. That's my impulse because I'm a wimp, okay? I don't want any part of resetting a dislocated shoulder. Don't touch it. When you've got a beam in your eye, when you have a tele... You've got a, let's not say a telephone pole. I mean, Christ meant a telephone pole, but let's say it's a six-foot stick that has, through, a, through some industrial accident, has driven it into your eye. Your first response is, don't touch it. Do not touch it. The same thing with my shoulder. I would say, do not touch it. However, you know what? It's about to take me a few minutes, and probably the longer I wait, the worse it's going to be. It's got to go back in. I have to live life. I cannot walk through life with a dislocated shoulder. So maybe I might just have to say, don't tell me when you're, and they're going to pull it. That hurt just doing that. But anyway, but whatever, it, it's going to have to go back in. And get, here's the thing. When that shoulder dislocates, I'm going to have to deal with that. It's the last thing I want to do. It's the last thing I want anyone else to do. But everything else just stopped until I deal with this. It's the same thing with our beam in our own eye. Don't touch it. It's painful. It's stuck in my eye. Do not touch it. The first thing we're going to have to do is deal with that. You have to deal with it. I have to deal with my sin. Oh, how, how wonderful it would be if I could just go out there and deal with everyone else's sin. I'm very comfortable. I'm very comfortable setting other people's shoulders. That's fine. But when it's my shoulder, when it's my shoulder, I'm not comfortable with that. You see, that's where the problem comes in. And that's why it's a good analogy. It starts with us. And I'll tell you this. If you were to get an enormous stick or a piece of rebar or something stick in your eye, and you decide this has to come out, and you grab it, and you get ready to start pulling it out, you're quickly going to realize, and maybe it's really wedged in there, and you can't get it, and you're going to understand very quickly, I may do far more damage then I'm going to do good. If I don't, do, you're going to very quickly, I'll tell you this, and hopefully, maybe there's people in this room that are in this point in your life, is you're saying, I recognize, okay, I get it. I have a beam in my eye. I recognize that. And I've tried to get it out, and man, the more I try to get it out, it just, it, it gets like it goes deeper, and it, it bleeds more, and I cannot get it out. What's the next thing you're going to do? I'm going to say, get me to a doctor. I can't, I can't pull that. I mean, I tried to pull it out, and I passed out from the pain Get me to a doctor. And I think that's a pretty reasonable application of Matthew chapter 9. Go to Matthew chapter 9, Julie. Matthew chapter 9, verses 10 through 13. It says, And it came to pass, as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. These are, these are folks with a lot of problems. These are folks that are an absolute mess. These are guys who you would probably say that, th that they're, they're beyond repair. They're beyond reform. Verse 11. 
But I'll say this, for all their problems, for all their faults, they're a disaster, but they're in the right place. Verse 11. When the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? They didn't ask him directly. But when Jesus overheard it, this is what he said. He said unto them, they, and I can imagine this is a pretty crowded setting, and they went over and kind of just mentioned it, you know, kind of quietly to his disciples. Jesus overheard it, and I think he loudly announced this and said this, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what that meaneth, and I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. He's saying, I'm extracting beams from eyes. That's what I've come to do. And these publicans, these thieves, these extortioners, these sinners, these prostitutes, these drunkards, they have come recognizing they have a beam in their eye, and I'm extracting beams from their eye, so either you need to be quiet and let me do my work as the great physician, or you need to get in line. But what you're doing now is wrong, because you've got a beam in your own eye. You're not healthy. But Christ is extracting those beams, and He does it precisely and perfectly and with healing power. He is the great physician. If I've got a beam in my eye, I'm going to go to the physician, to a physician, but I'm talking here about the physician. We need a doctor. And so I would say this, and again, I want to be careful with our time this morning, but I say this, through Christ's power, with the power of Christ. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. In Christ, with Christ, step one. It's a two-step process. Step one. Where do we start? In, in this challenge that's been issued by Christ, where do we even start? Step one, we remove the beam out of our own eye. We deal with our own personal sin. We deal with it. We start inwardly and understand this is a lifelong pursuit. You're going to be checking your eye every single day and removing obstructions in your own eye. It always starts inwardly. It always starts with ourselves. But I want you to understand something. It does not stop there. There's, this is a two-step process. Step one, deal with the beam in your own eye. Start inwardly. Step two, you now see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Once, once that beam is removed, once your sight is being restored to where now you can see clearly, now help your brother with clear vision, no longer blinded, now help your brother with the speck in his eye. <laughs> through the power of Christ, in Christ, through Christ the great physician, remove the beam from your own eye and then see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Matthew chapter 28. Last scripture we'll look at very quickly. Verses 18 through 20. This is where step two comes in. And Jesus came. This is after his resurrection. This is the great sending of the disciples. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Is that true? Does he have all power? I think most Christians have not settled that in their mind. They would say, yes, Jesus is powerful. But there's other things out there too. All power. I don't care what your opinion is, what you think, what I think, what, what um, the, the physical church thinks. I don't care what the government thinks. None of that matters. What does Christ think? That's all that matters. That's what that statement is saying. I don't care what you think. I care what Christ thinks. You have zero power. If he has all power, how much does that leave for you? How much does that leave for me? I have zero. He has all power. Is given unto me in heaven and in earth. He is the singular authority, the sole authority on everything, no one else. And in light of that, he said, this is what I'm telling you to do. And as soon as he says it, he can say, the religious leaders, the governmental leaders are saying, don't do this. I'm telling you to do it. And you know what that means? You do it. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Make disciples of all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. What Jesus has commanded. 
You know what's implied there in verse 20? It's not happening. People are not doing what Jesus commanded. So Jesus looks at you and says, you go tell them. You go and tell them. You go tell them and teach them and mentor them and disciple them to observe all things whatsoever Jesus, who has all power, has commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. When, when I say we now see clearly, our blindness is removed. We now see clearly to help our brother understand you can't do anything to help your brother. That's the next thing you're going to realize immediately. You can't get the beam out of your own eye and you can't even get the speck on their eye. Christ has to be with you always. There, I'll put it this way, there are a lot of specks out there lodged into eyes. That's the, that's the nations, that's the world. That's right outside of this building. Maybe inside of this building. I would describe it as this, spiritual blindness. Teach them to observe because they're not doing it. That's the Great Commission. That's what we're called to do. That's the challenge. That's what I'm challenging you with. It's what I've just read. Get the beam out of your eye. Go ye into all nations and make disciples. Because Christ has all power. Now that's, that's a good little sermon, right? Let's get specific. Now this is the, this is the hard part. This is the bad part. It's a great general, it's a great universal general call. It's a, it's a great universal general challenge. But now let's be specific. I'll throw some specifics to this. Actually, I, I received some this week. Six strategic actions within the Southern Baptist Convention. I don't know what you heard in the news this past week. I'll just, I'll just say it this way. Most of it was misrepresentations. The rest of it was lies. I've read the New York Times. I've read the L.A. Times. I read it and I said, what, what convention were they at? I saw some deep conviction. I saw some unity at the Southern Baptist Convention. I've never been before. Went this past week to Nashville. I saw 16,000 delegates, very few of which weren't there for the same mission to say, we have to get this done. No matter what it takes, we're going to do the hard things. Here are six strategic actions. It's called vision. How appropriate. We're getting the beam out of our eye. Now we have a vision. 2025. You may say, well, 2025, that's a long ways away. <laughs> Not when you hear these strategic actions. Action number one. Increase our total number of full-time, fully funded missionaries by a net gain of 500 by 2025. They want, 25, they want 500 more missionaries on the field throughout the world in 2025 than there are today. That would give us 4,200 full-time missionaries, fully funded missionaries through the IMB. 500 missionaries. A net, and they have 300 coming out of the field through retirement and attrition every year. A net increase to 4,200 missionaries. Are you ready for the challenge? Is that you? Do you have a suitcase? We saw 64. 64 missionary couples. That didn't make the news. Big surprise. 64 missionary couples were commissioned at this Southern Baptist Convention. I would say at least half, 30 of them, stood back behind a screen. All you can see was their silhouette because they're going to places that are so dangerous. It's not safe for their face to be shown that they're being sent out. And they said, my name is so-and-so, first name, this is my wife. We're being sent out from this Southern Baptist Church with our four children. That's challenging. With our four young children, we're going into danger. Why would you do that? The world looks at that like, I look at these guys doing bodybuilding and bench press competitions and think, why would you do that? You know why they're doing it? Because they believe that Jesus has all power. Period. End of paragraph. 
That's why. Because He has all power. They're going because He's called them to go. 500 missionaries. They come from churches. You know, this is 50% of this big Southern Baptist Convention of almost 50,000 churches is made up of congregations of less than 100 people. This is the norm. This isn't just mega churches. It's from churches just like this. Is God calling you or me to be an IMB missionary and to be one of those 500? That's just the first one. You want to be specific? That's just the first one. Let's go to the second one. Add 5,000 new churches to our Southern Baptist family, giving us more than 50,000 churches. You know what that's saying? They're calling on every single Southern Baptist church to plant a church. Either for that church to plant a church or for them to partner with other churches to plant a church. They're calling Marble Hill Baptist Church to plant a church. And here's the thing, not in Blount County. Where? How about Chicago? Are you challenged yet? I'm just telling you, this is what I was presented this past week. Me, Janet, Jake, and Margaret, this is what I was presented. I'm just delivering it back to you. Chicago, Seattle, Idaho. They have, they, they got the inner, they've got the cities. They know where they need a church in that community. And here's, here's where it gets even more challenging. You ready for, how are we going to do all this? Strategic, strategic action number three. Increase our total number of workers in the field through a new emphasis on calling out the called. And then preparing those who are called out by the Lord. Now here's where this challenge comes in. This is kind of a Gideon moment. Remember the story of Gideon where he has this army that's way overmatched? And, I mean, they've got way more troops. I can't remember the exact numbers, but it's like they have 10 or 20 times more than Gideon. And Gideon's going to go fight them. And God says, oh, no, no, not yet. Send the vast majority of them home and fight them with, what was it, 300? Go take it. You have too many men. We're outnumbered 10 to 1. You got too many. I want you outnumbered 100 to 1, 1,000 to 1. Now go fight them. You know what this initiative is saying? Send them. And here's the thing. Send your best. We want your pastor. We want your youth pastors. We want the leaders in your church. We want your best. Those that have already done ministry, we want you to send them. What, what's Marble Hill going to do? Look around. And I'm the only person in this room Somebody has to step up. Next man up. What are you going to do when Tom Brady breaks his leg? Who's the backup quarterback? You've got 30 seconds. Get on the field. That's what you have to do. Send out your best. Calling out. Oh, I'm already called. I'm called to be a pastor of, of this local church here in Friendsville. We're calling out the called. Not just the called, but calling out the called. What that means is nobody's exempted. It's not, hey, pastors, go send your people. It may be, pastor, pack your bag and go. Who's going to be the pastor now? Who's this congregation going to call to continue to work here, to support us there because it would be a sister church to this church? This church has to stand for that to happen. I'll speed up. Number four. That's the first three strategic actions. Do you even want to hear the next three? I mean, this is, this is challenging. Yeah, I was tempted to not say any of this because it's that challenging. Action number four. Turn around our ongoing decline in reaching, baptizing, and discipling those under the age of 18. The numbers look like this. The charts look like this for baptizing, for, for seeing young people, especially teenagers, saved and baptized. It looks like this over time. You get to 20, about 18, 19, 20, 21, it's down here. Last week, week before last was a big deal. Vacation Bible School is a big deal. 
We have to keep doing it. We have to, we have to, do, to do what we're doing, but then do more. Kids are, most people get saved when they're kids. I got saved at 10. Raise your hand if you got saved under the age of 18. Look around. That doesn't lie. That, that's here. Reaching kids, teenagers, young adults under the age of 18. To reverse, it's an avalanche coming down. And this is, they have the audacity to say, push the avalanche back. That's a challenge. That's hard. But that's what we're being challenged to do. Number five. In light of what I've, if I just read this one, you'd say, man, that's, that's crazy. That's hard. In light of what, this is the easiest one. Increase our annual giving in successive years to reach and surpass 500 million given through the cooperative programs to achieve these great commission goals. It costs money. It costs a lot of money to do this. To put a missionary, to put a missionary family on the foreign field is incredibly expensive. It is astronomically expensive. Let me now say this. It's worth it. It's worth it. If you're going to spend a dime, spend it on that. It's worth it. They're holding the rope for these people. Medical problems, medical insurance, retirement. They're having to hold the rope for these families. It's expensive, but we have to do it. This is, this is the easiest one. Writing a check is easy. And I want to say this, as a church here at Marble Hill, we're committed to increasing our giving to the cooperative program. I want to see our numbers to Annie Armstrong offering for the North American Mission Board, the uh, Lottie Moon Christmas offering for the International Mission Board to increase year after year. We want, to, we want to systematically increase that every year. We've been increasing it substantially. I want to continue to increase it. Last of all, I said that number five, probably the easiest. Number six should be the easiest. When you pull, when you pull a piece of rebar out of your eye, that's messy. When you get that thing pulled out, there's going to be blood splurred out. But you got to do it. Number six, this isn't something real pleasant to talk about. That's why we absolutely have to talk about it. Prayerfully endeavor before God to eliminate all instances of sexual abuse and racial discrimination among our churches. That's a challenge. And that's messy. I'll just, I'm just going to go ahead and and put the cards on the table and say, this is how I would paraphrase what I saw at the convention this year in regards to sexual abuse within the church. I saw a delegate stand up and say, we will not be the Catholic Church. There will be transparency, accountability, and there was a resolution passed to say this, if you abuse, if you are, if you, uh, accusations can be made. Do, everybody say this with me together. Accusations can be false. You, have, you cannot lose sight of this. Let's say that together. Accusations can be false. Our culture doesn't know that. But if the accusation is true, and someone is found guilty of committing sexual abuse in a role of authority, whether it's a youth pastor, whether it's a Sunday school teacher, whether it's a pastor, whether it's a deacon in a Southern Baptist church, guess what? It's a lifetime ban from leadership, and I applaud it. You're done. You will never be a leader again. Now, there was some, there was some apprehension saying, you know, there is forgiveness, there is grace. They're exactly right. I, I support that wholeheartedly. But you are done for the rest of your life in leadership. You're dead. You're done. And you should be. You can repent. You can, you can experience forgiveness and reconciliation. But you will never again be in leadership. Because I love you, but I love kids too. I love women too. I love, I love abuse victims too. And you're done. They're taking it seriously. And I applaud that, and I'm so thrilled to be a part of that. Did you hear that in the news? I tell you, I, I'm trying not to be pessimistic about the news, but if what gets reported and what I saw, if that, just forget it. You have, you have proven yourself untrustworthy. I love when I can check the story out myself to see how did they report what I saw. What I saw with my own eyes and heard with my own ears. It's a misrepresentation. I'm telling you, I'm excited to be a Southern Baptist. I've never been more excited to be a Southern Baptist than I am today for these reasons.
The second thing, racial discrimination. <sighs> this should be the easiest thing. Now, where did Jesus tell us to go again? All nations. All nations. I know, I know there has been racism in the Southern Baptist Church. I know there's been racism in this Southern Baptist Church. It's dead. It will be crucified. It will be crucified. I know, hey, this area, I understand, you know, the history. It's dead. <laughs> there is nothing more contradictory than a, a racist Christian. A racist follower of, a, of Christ who is Jewish, who is not Caucasian, he's not European. A racist follower of Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, and in his call to send us to all nations. It's a contradiction in terms. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. If I was going to be a racist, the first thing I would do is completely break all ties with any Southern Baptist church. It's the opposite of what everything that I believe and stand for if I'm going to be a racist. Racism has to die. It has to die. We have to take racism seriously. And if there's, if there, you need to search your heart. I need to search my heart. If there is a, a, if there is a racist speck in my heart, it has to be cut out, removed with a scalpel, cut out and removed and repented of probably on this altar. Again, these are messy things, but they have to be dealt with. I've said all that. I know I've said a lot. Happy Father's Day. Um, we've canceled tonight's service, so I've got to get, you know, two, two licks in through this message. But I'm going to ask Bill to come if he would. And he's got a song for us. I've asked him if he would to lead us in There's Power in the Blood. Because I have hopefully provoked you and challenged you for what I said to begin this message. And I hope we, there's something in us that says, yes, let's do it. I'm ready to go. But then I hit you with your opponent. Then I introduce you to your opponent. And suddenly you can feel that boldness just like run out of, run out of your feet onto the floor saying that's tough I love Friendsville I don't want to move <sighs> let's tell this message do you remember it's been a while back challenge accepted the challenge has been issued has it not you got a hat you know where Gabby's really got a hat she's got one on right now Literally. We all have our hats figuratively. You can walk out of here with it on your head. Guy standing in the ring saying, I'm your opponent. Come and get me. It takes a toughness. I think it's put there by God. <sighs> to say, I'm so outmatched. That opponent is so much bigger than me. Take your hat off and throw it and say, I'm going to get it. I may get beat down and beat down and beat down. I'm going to get it. I can tell you, I can't be a pastor. It's not in me. I'm too shy. I'm terrified of getting up in front of people. I don't have it. And God challenged me. He said, get up here. Get up here in the ring. And eventually, you just throw a bend in the wind and throw your hat and say, I'm going. I'm going. And you say with that boldness, and this is the easy part, challenge accepted. Challenge accepted. That's the challenge this morning for everybody in this room, especially for men, especially for fathers. Is that not a challenge? Let's stand and sing this together. I'll tell you, when you really undertake something like this, you're going to need power. And you're going to find out, and again, this is what God wants to do. We're all at different points. Maybe you're still working on that beam, but I'm telling you, you're never going to get it all the way out. You're going to have to deal with that beam, deal with it consistently, deal with it realistically, objectively, honestly. 
But when you see clearly, you've got to start, you've got to start getting to step two and being a great commission Baptist. This is a challenge. This is a challenge that I'm issuing you this morning. These are some things to think on. But when you really start digging into these things, when you take those challenges, you're going to recognize, I have to have power. And I don't have any. But that's why we're going to sing this song as we close.